are you? Good. I went to the city thing instead, oh, no, no, instead of the international yeah, thing. No. I figure cities are somewhat, you know, international. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me? All right. There's an imbalance in the room. There's more people on this side than that side. I don't know if that means anything. If the, there could be some tilting, it looks like to the left. It's tilting to the left or, but, or stage right. Uh, well, what? Well, Say that? Uh, well, I hope you're all enjoying your, your, your dinner and you've been, uh, your lunch and uh, been uh, pretty active today. Um, this is a, a panel on the interface with states and tribes and EPA. We've been hearing a lot over the last uh, day about um, EPA and, and what it needs to do in the future. Um, and almost in every one of those conversations is how does it relate to the business community, to cities, and to um, states and tribes. And so obviously these relationships are pretty important, and that's what we're going to be talking about here with our great panel. Um, speaking of great panel, we have Cynthia Harris, who's the Deputy Director of the Center for State and Tribal and Local Environmental Programs at the Environmental Law Institute. We have Larry Roberts, who's counsel at Kilpatrick and Townsend, and the former Acting Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs at the Department of Interior. And we have Martha Rudolph, who I think many of you have met already during the course of the last day, who's the former Director of Environmental Programs at the Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment, and, and equally, or almost equally important, I can't say it's equally important, but almost equally important, she's the former President of the Environmental Council of States, which is, as many of you know, the group of state environmental commissioners that work together, particularly to work with EPA. Um, I know when I was the deputy administrator, uh, working with ECOS was really one of the highlights of my, of my time and, and all the different things we were able to do to try to continue to improve things. And so, um, as I mentioned, we've heard a lot about this, these relationships, and I'm gonna set a little bit of context here and then we'll have each uh, panelists go through their presentation. I'm not going to ask a lot of questions when we do that because I want to make sure we get time for, our, for audience uh, participation. Um, but what we've heard a lot about uh, these relationships, particularly state and tribal relationships over the last couple of days, is how important it, it is going to be for the, the, has been for the success of the environmental enterprise in the United States but also how important it's gonna to be to the future of EPA, what that relationship is like. We've also heard how hard it is to get it right. And we've also heard that there's a lot of work going on to try to improve it. So I, I think a quick scan of history, which has been in a little bit of each one of the presentations we've had today, you know, I have this, you know, this DOS 1.0 kind of view of EPA sometimes, and, and I, <laughs> That's right, an A prompt, those of you know what it is. Um, or even the language, Edlin. So, um, you know, I used to, I used to refer to, uh, and I worked with the, I didn't, wasn't working at EPA, but I worked with EPA in the early 70s, which is what I call EPA 1.0, where virtually most of the programs that Congress enacted in the early 70s had to be implemented, or at least begun to be implemented you know, getting NPDES permits written, all these other things, um, clean air uh, permits. And, you know, Congress had just decided that discharging pollutants into the water and the air was no longer free. And somebody had to gather that up a little bit. And so 1.0 is sort of EPA had to take a lot of the responsibility. There, of course, there were state programs out there. Some were fledgling, some were mature. Um, but it was not universal in any stretch of the imagination. So EPA set up 10 regional offices, and a lot of their responsibility was getting this work done. And then there's a, a, a longish, the next two periods are a lot longer. You know, when I worked for the state of Maryland, I was the second secretary of environment in the state of Maryland, and that was in the late 1980s. You know, the Maryland did not have a Maryland Department of the Environment until the mid-1980s. 
And so, you know, it was scattered about in different parts of the part. So there was no analog to EPA for almost 16 years after the enactment of some of these major laws in, in, a, in, in Maryland. And so that, I, don't th I think that might be unusually long, but it may not be unusual. And so then there became this period of what I call EPA 2.0, where there was this evolving state capacity, which grew up through the 80s and into the 90s, where states became more and more, um, they gained more and more capacity, more and more experience. Some EPA employees left the EPA and went to work for the states and vice versa. Um, but state capacity was in a growing and sophisticated period. And all of a sudden, um, we started at the inklings of what I call EPA 3.0, which you know, um, probably is in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the aughts, maybe in the late 90s, where uh, how do we really do a better job of, of this? The, the linear kind of oversight model was not really working. Um, I mean, it worked, but it was not being productive. And uh, you know, we've heard about this several times in presentations, the doers, the, the overseers, and I called the redoers. Um, you know, so, and we've had processes, and this is bipartisan. Every EPA um, leader, set of leaders since the, since the 90s has been trying to find ways with state leaders to do a better job of this. We've had things like performance partnership agreements. We've had all other kinds of things. We're now in these leaning processes. And these things transcend administrations, and I think they will continue to transcend. And as Don Welsh was telling, the current um, executive director of ECOS was telling us yesterday, um, you know, these, these processes are, are getting traction on all sides, and people are are really looking hard on how we can make what he called the blocking and tackling, the basic work we have to do at the foundation together as the enterprise. How do we get that done in the most efficient way? Because as I've mentioned in, in panels yesterday, we need to find a way to get beyond that blocking and tackling of the basic stuff. And how are we gonna solve these bigger multi-jurisdictional, multi-sectoral issues, whether they're environmental justice, climate change, materials management, all these other things that are much more systemic as opposed to more facility oriented. And that gets even harder if we don't get the blocking and tackling uh, more efficient. So these are the things that are, that are out there. And I wanna um, say something quickly on the, on the tribal front, because some of these same forces are buffeting us at the tribal level. When, when I started at EPA in the early 90s as the assistant administrator for water, since water had the most funding that was going to tribes, Carol Browner suggested after we had many meetings with tribes that we needed to have an, an American Indian environmental office at EPA. And she said, Bob, you set it up because you have the most money. I mean, it was really, I think she may have trusted me to get it done, but nonetheless, it was, it was, that was the kind of funny thing that we said about it. But it was, it was true. Most of the relationships at EPA in the, in the, 1980s and the 1990s was on the waterfront with on the water, not on the waterfront, but on the water issues with with tribes. And so, and and then in the Obama administration, we moved that office into into the under the AA ship for international development and added tribes. So we have international and tribal affairs at the assistant administrator level, political appointee confirmed by the United States Congress. And I think that that's been a good evolution, but what's still lagging on the evolution, like it is every, in, in many other the relationships that we've been talking about needed for EPA's future, is the relationship with tribes. We used to have this thing, which is actually in some of the laws, called TISMUS, treated in the same manner as a state. I can tell you how much tribes love that. Frank, they love it, don't they? No, because it's, it's no. Um, the uh, tribes are not similar to the states. They, they, they operate with the federal government under treaties and trust agreements. They're not, they're not you know, and, and the, the combined land in those, uh, in those is, almost, is the size of New England. And so um, there's a whole different uh, way that, that we need to deal with uh, the relationships with tribes. And, you know, uh, the, 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 the the tribes relate to the federal government under these agreements, not to the state governments. 
So, you, you know, it's not like they're a subdivision of a state. So we really have, you know, work to do there in terms of how uh, that all works as part of our, our overall um, responsibilities. And what is the responsibility EPA? I, I have my personal answer to this. I'm throwing it out for the, for the conversation. Uh, what is the responsibility of the EPA uh, in its trust responsibilities uh, for tribes, which is a different responsibility than its constitutional responsibilities under a federalism and working with states. So I'm going to stop there, as this is contextual stuff. Um, and I'm going to, um, I, I have no particular rhyme or reason here, so I think I'll just go in, in order here. Cynthia, if you're willing, is, is yours up first? There you go. I, I got that right. All right, well, enjoy this. Thank you, Bob. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Who here is, has familiarity with federal Indian law? Any show of hands? Okay. So actually more than I'm used to seeing, so that's pretty good. And I really appreciate American University for organizing this panel because so often we don't hear about the tribal perspective when uh, tribes play such an important role when it comes to environmental protection, managing a number of programs under the major environmental statutes under treatment of state. Of course, that terminology is more than a little problematic. And also in terms of natural resource management, uh, both in terms of natural resources on and off reservations or tribal trust land. So I'll discuss that a bit. I understand I'm supposed to keep this presentation within 10 to 15 minutes, and I did not laugh maniacally when I heard that. So it's a good thing this is a lunchtime panel because we're going to power through some basic principles of federal Indian law. And then I'll turn over to Larry, who will go into a lot more detail about the specific relationship between tribes and the EPA and the federal government. Let's go. I'll be running through some background, and then I will discuss some of the major principles of federal Indian law to set it up so you can better understand and participate in the discussion, as well as touch on some emerging issues, some of which may be familiar to those of you working in this field. I won't run through all the statistics, but what I really want to point out is there are 573 federally recognized tribes, and that's not even including uh, tribes that are recognized by states or they're cer currently seeking recognition. And the most important point I want to make about that is that these are each individual sovereign governments with their own tribal codes and laws, often with their own court system. So it is a relationship between each tribe and the federal government. And it's important to keep that in mind, not sort of agglomerate tribal interests together, because each tribe has its own priorities when it comes to environmental protection and when it comes to managing resources and its own unique agreement with the federal government under the various uh, treaties and statutes, especially in the case of Alaska Natives. I'll note that I won't go into Alaska context. It's a very specific. I like to joke that everything that you know about federal Indian law, once you talk about Alaska, you have to check about 40 to 50% of it and learn something new. So you can come see me after class if you have questions about that. <laughs> there are major eras or periods in the relationship between tribes and the federal government. That could be an entire uh, day-long discussion, but I want to point that out because history is very, very important for contextualizing the relationship. And the most important thing to know is that the pendulum has swung in the relationship between the federal government and the tribes. Early on, it was more of a relationship between equals. After the Revolutionary War, the U.S. was pretty impoverished. That uh, that, that took a turn, I think we can all agree, for the worst during the formative years. That was during the relocation of tribes to quote unquote Indian country to make room for settlers, more land, more resources. And this was when the Trail of Tears occurred. Then there was the uh, period of attempted assimilation and allotment. And the General Allotment Act or the Dawes Act is the reason why we have a checkerboard pattern of land ownership 
on an Indian country today, which really impacts uh, tribal jurisdiction. This was to assimilate uh, tribal members into society by allocating land, but really the quote-unquote surplus land was, was given to settlers and quite a bit of the land that was originally allotted to individual tribal members did end up in other hands. Now, the pendulum did swing back during the late 1920s. During This was the period of the Indian Reorganization Act, the development of uh, tribal constitutions. And then the pendulum swung uh, again during termination relocation. This was another attempt to assimilate uh, tribal members into a main, quote unquote, mainstream society. And uh, this, a number of tribes, over 100, their relationship with the federal government was terminated. They were no longer recognized as sovereign entities. And a number of they lost a number of federal services. We're currently in the period of self-determination, which is quite a bit different. So we're seeing more control over uh, by tribes over various programs and over natural resources. So let's go through very quickly, I promise, as quickly as possible, <laughs> through these major principles. For those of you who are new to the subject, as a bit of terminology, there's a big difference between federal Indian law, which is what we're focusing on here, which is the relationship between the federal government and the different tribes. This is different from tribal law. Tribal law refers to the law of each of those, I mentioned 573 federally recognized tribes. So for those of you who are interested in working with tribes or practicing uh, uh, it, tribal law, that means learning the law of that particular tribe. And often you see these terms mixed up, but there is a difference. And I included a couple resources there for those who are interested. Another bit of terminology is Indian country, and that's actually a legal term of art. It's included in the US code. When we think about Indian country, we mostly think about reservations within the borders of those reservations, but it can also include allotments and includes also all dependent Indian communities. This is particularly important for the Alaska context. Just briefly, uh, there was an important court decision called the Antai, which determined that uh, the Alaska Native uh, Settlement, uh, Claim Settlement Act, ANSCA, which when it terminated Aboriginal title and all reservations except one essentially meant that uh, land owned by the uh, Alaska Native Villages and Corporations no longer constitutes Indian country, which has had, uh, to, to put it, uh, to understate it has had a lot of consequences in terms of tribal jurisdiction and natural resource management. Anyone here remember the first year of property? You might have heard it, remember this case, Johnson versus McIntosh? Okay. Yes, uh, we all have uh, opinions about that one. <laughs> this, this case essentially was a bit of, well, more than a bit of justification for uh, the fact that the United States has full title, has full title to Indian country to tribal trust lands and the rights of tribes as, as far as uh, ownership of, to title goes is use of fructuary. It's to use and occupy, but full title is vested in the federal government. And again, this is probably the most important point. It has to do with tribal sovereignty. It's it, again an, an individual relationship between the federal government and the tribes. Tribes, recall, pre-exist the United States government. The tribes have occupied or owned these, these lands since time immemorial. Uh, tribes are considered domestic dependent nations. That comes from another major Marshall case. It is a relationship, as was mentioned earlier, between its best in the federal government and the tribes. It is not between the tribes and the states. States have no jurisdiction, although there is one exception, Public Law 280, where states are, are granted uh, civil and criminal jurisdiction with some exceptions. But even in, under that case, uh, 
uh, tribes do maintain regulatory jurisdiction over tribal members. The relationship between tribes and the federal government is often the, the terms of that relationship are often found in the treaties between the tribes and the federal government. And this occurred up to 1871 when treaty making stopped because the House of Representatives wanted to step in and be involved in the process. Uh, tribes exchanged land and peace for US, promises, promise, US promises for reservations to recognize sovereignty uh, and for protection services. Key here is that the rights that tribes have under these treaties, these are rights that were not granted. These are reserved rights. Again, tribes pre-exist the United States, so these are all rights that are reserved rights, the retained rights. And important in terms of environmental protection, natural resources, is these include rights to natural resources. Often uh, we discuss off-reservation rights uh, involving hunting, fishing, gathering. So that's something very much to keep in mind. Now, Congress does, and this is another uh, key principle of federal Indian law, Congress has plenary authority. And that means that Congress can abrogate terms of the treaty. But it must be stated explicitly. As you can imagine, for, for those who are history buffs of, of, uh, tri of tribal history, of the relationship between the federal government and the tribes, these treaties were not made under uh, on an equal playing field by any extent of the imagination. Yeah, I think we all know that. And the, the key point, there are four cans of construction of interpreting treaties and other statutes addressing tribes. The key here is that these instruments must be construed in favor of the tribes and according to the way that tribes understood the terms when they were made. And this is very, very important number of a number of cases that made up to the Supreme Court, especially those, the ones that some of you might be more familiar with are the Stevens Treaties in the Pacific Northwest. They have to do with off-reservation fishery rights. And they're construed to, uh, to understand that tribes, tribal members, have the right to, uh, to access fishery resources in usual custom places, that, that having access to fishery implies that there must be uh, a certain amount of fish, there must be fish available in the first place that's to a certain portion. Now, I may have mentioned earlier that, th that there's a very sp special relationship between the federal government and tribes, and this is the trust relationship. It is a fiduciary relationship, and it means that the U.S. is obligated to act fairly in its dealing with Indian nations. It's, it's a very, very high moral obligation. And one term that you, for those who are following some cases like Dakota Access that you hear is consultation. That's government to government consultation. Again, stressing that this is a relationship between sovereign nations. It is a consultation between two nations. And the key here is that it must be meaningful consultation. Now, this is an obligation that's not, it's not a constitutional obligation, except for a few exceptions. It's not really a statutory obligation. Well, there's an exception for his historical resources and that sort of thing. Now, in our neighbors to the north, uh, Canada, it is actually um, a legally enforceable obligation. The Canadian Constitution, Section 35, affirms treaty rights with First Nations and consultation is required by the honor of the crown. We don't have that here, <laughs> here uh, in the United States. So the type of consultation is referred to as executive order consultation. So it's a lot easier to get, a, to, to get around that than a constitutional or statutory obligation, but it is something that federal agencies generally take uh, quite seriously. It's, it's fairly recent. Only since this, well, there's been different permutations, but since uh, 2000 under Clinton, the different federal agencies, including the Department of Interior and the EPA, have uh, developed policies to 
uh, to specify what exactly is meant by consultation coordination. There are, there are quite a number of processes that are involved that I believe Larry will, will discuss. And also the EPA has a policy on treaty rights, uh, on and off reservation treaty rights. Tribal jurisdiction, it is a very, very, very complex uh, topic. But key here is that tribal jurisdiction over non-members is very limited. Uh, tribes have jurisdiction over tribal members, of course, but no jurisdiction over, criminal jurisdiction over non-members uh, under the Offlant case. Uh, civil's jurisdiction is an, is an evolving uh, matter. Generally speaking, there are tribes do not have civil jurisdiction over non-members, except for two exceptions. Uh, these are the Montana exceptions. There are two tests. There's the consensual relationship tests, uh, which, for example, would be a, a contractual relationship between a tribe and non-members. And then there's the substantial interest test, and this is quite important when it comes to environmental programs as tribes manage uh, uh, under the treatment of state provisions, they manage programs under the major environmental statutes, those tribes that, that choose to do so and are, are approved for that. Now, there is a question about land status that I will just uh, mention tangentially. Under Montana, it seemed that this restriction only applied to non-tribal fee lands and that tribes maintain jurisdiction when it came to tribal lands, but there are a couple cases after that that call that into question whether that's really applicable. So I won't go too much into this, but I mentioned that we're ER, we are within the era of tribal self-determination, and there have been a couple statutes passed which empower tribes to manage federal programs on their own. There are 638 contracts where tribes take over specific federal programs, and there's compacting where tribes determine their own prior highest priority needs rather than having that decision imposed from the federal government. Co-management is another way that tribes have really been empowered to manage natural resources, including off-reservations. There's a program project that we're working on at ELI having to do with co-management of fishery resources in the Arctic. It's a fascinating discussion, but co-management essentially means that tribes partner with federal agencies to most effectively manage tribal use of certain resources. It could be a, a land like a park, or it could be over uh, fishery resources, animals, that sort of thing. And it is an evolving era. Uh, there, there are some limitations, but under federal Indian law, because tribes are sovereign nations, uh, there, there may be fewer limitations, generally speaking, than otherwise when the federal government delegates power to another entity. So I'm just going to touch on some emerging issues. Of course, funding. A number of tribes, uh, like states, but uh, in, to a different degree, do rely on federal funding to for environmental protection programs for managing natural resources. The proposed presidential budget has significant cuts, and that is anticipated to to impact tribes' abilities and their resources to, in terms of environmental protection. So I'm just going to run through very quickly. Uh, a couple of few emerging issues. Uh, Dakota access, I know a number of us have been following that. That has to do with consultation, but again, that's a, that is not a legally enforceable obligation by tribes on, on US agencies. However, tribes have brought that up in terms of environmental assessments and then under the National Historic Pre Preservation Act, which does require consultation. Beers ears, that's another issue. There, the President Obama had designated over a million acres as a national monument. The current administration has significantly uh, cut that down to size. However, what was unique about that was that when that monument was designated, it was a first of its kind intertribal commission that was created as well. Climate change. This is a very significant issue for tribes. It is impacting them right now. 
As in the case around the world, uh, communities which have contributed the least to greenhouse gas emissions are very much on the front line of being impacted by climate change. And this is happening right here in the United States, not just in terms of sea level rise, but in terms of heat, in terms of impact of cultural resources uh, that, that are very important to tribes. A number of tribes have developed very innovative climate action plans in terms of moving to renewable energies, in terms of adaptation. And a number of tribes actually are moving. They're relocating their communities right now. And they're uh, in Alaska. Um, this is actually a picture at the top from Shishmarif. This is what happens when permafrost starts melting. You hit, there are over 30 Alaska native villages that are uh, very much in peril. Uh, at least four are in the process of moving right now. It's extremely expensive. There is no single federal agency that uh, oversees that. In the previous slide, you saw that uh, climate resilience funding has been proposed for, for elimination in the 2020 budget. So just to illustrate, uh, the native village of New Talk is losing 70 feet, 70 feet of land to erosion every year. So this is something that's very much happening right now, uh, of course, in the Gulf Coast area, as well as in the Pacific Northwest. And that's just uh, a few examples. So with that, I want to thank you, everyone, for being here, for really uh, bringing up the discussion of the federal tribal relationship. And we have Larry who can discuss a lot more about the relationship between the EPA and tribes. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, I guess I should just comment at the outset that um, Cynthia has tried to compress over 200 years of law and history. And you all are probably feeling like you're learning a native language over the course of lunch. So we hope that you take away, you know, hello, goodbye, those sorts of things. But uh, hopefully this uh, piques your interest in uh, working with tribes and tribal communities. I also want to um, thank Amanda Leiter and uh, American University and especially Ingrid for helping pull this conference together and uh, making it enjoyable. So it's really great to be with everyone. Um, I'm a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin. Um, I'm 50 years old. I'm a product of Indian gaming. Has anyone heard of Indian gaming? Yeah. So you think of Indian gaming and you see the headlines and all those things. I wouldn't be standing before you all but for Indian gaming. My tribe paid for my college education. My tribe has supported me over the years. And so um, it's something that I think um, the media doesn't pick up sometimes, but it's important to keep in mind. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through uh, things as quickly as possible but I'm because uh, we want to have time for questions. And so I just wanted to uh, start off by talking about treatment as a state. And when, was this, when were these enacted, these, these laws? So the Clean Water Act was 1987, so that's over 30 years ago. Clean Air Act, 1990. You have 60 tribes, according to EPA's website, that are administering regulatory programs under the Clean Water Act. You have 12 uh, administering regulatory programs under the Clean Air Act. All of these are on reservation. Um, so uh, 30 years, uh, why so few, right? I mean, there's only 60 tribes running regulatory programs, and we just heard there's over, there, there are 573 federally recognized tribes. Uh, I think part of it, is historically EPA's approach to implementing these provisions of the law. So um, the Clean Water Act for, for years, for decades, um, the EPA um, looked to see whether a tribe had inherent authority over non-Indians within a reservation. That's a very fact-intensive process. There were good arguments that EPA recognized that it was just a delegation of authority, that tribes didn't have to prove that they had authority over non-Indians within the reservation, but that Congress just delegated this federal authority. Courts made note of that, and over time, EPA changed its, um, its interpretation um, to, to recognize that perhaps tribes don't have to go through this uh, fact-intensive process to show that they have authority over, over um, environmental matters, and invo especially involving non-Indians within their reservations when you're talking about clean water. 
The other thing um, is EPA was slowed down in their implementation of these programs very early on through litigation. Um, so Albuquerque uh, versus Browner, Montana versus EPA, Wisconsin versus EPA. There was a lot of concern in these early years of EPA implementing treatment as a state as to how that would impact states. Um, I will say EPA prevailed in all of that litigation. Um, and that I, I think nowadays that, that type of litigation where states are challenging EPA's approval of tribes to administer programs is a little antiquated. I think, I think we've, we've progressed over the, over the past few decades and, and tribes and states are really working uh, closer together and you see less of this, this type of litigation. I think it's always helpful and it's not really all that apparent on, on this projection, but I think it's always helpful to see where these programs are being implemented on a map. And so the blue is, is those tribes that have implemented uh, Clean Water Act, yellow is uh, treatment as a state under the Clean Air Act, both regulatory and non-regulatory programs. Um, I would just point out the regional differences. So where you see those little circles, you see Washington State and the tribes within Washington State, lots of implementation. Michigan, not so much. Um, North Dakota, not so much. South Dakota, not so much. I would say that, I would posit that part of that may be resources uh, that the tribes lack in terms of um, implementing these federal programs, but uh, it may also be concern about litigation and getting slowed down through litigation. Um, So part of the challenge, I think, remains because there are, again, a very small number of tribes that are um, actually, when you look at the 573, that are implementing environmental programs. I think part of the challenge is outreach to tribes and to states who, to um, achieve implementation. Change is always hard. Um, there's always needs to be strong lines of communications between states, tribes, and the federal government in implementing these programs, and you need to build trust. And so these dynamics were uh, a focus of the Obama administration. And so um, in campaigning for president, Senator, then Senator Obama, he pledged an annual conference and cabinet level engagement with tribal leaders. And every year he met with tribal leaders and every year cabinet secretaries met with tribal leaders. And this became the norm. This was the norm. Cabinet secretaries were traveling to Indian country. Secretary Jewell uh, made a point whenever she traveled, whether it was to a national park or to a state, to visit Indian country, to visit a tribe, to visit a school, to learn things. This dialogue was common and it built trust. Dialogue wasn't a one-off. It was a continuing progress and conversation. And so at these annual meetings that the White House sponsored, there would be breakout sessions with tribal leaders to discuss various issues like the environment. There was an annual report of not only the activities that the agencies and tribes undertook and the progress that was being made, but the next steps to be made. Um, and then there was obviously the president's visit to Standing Rock. And when the president visited Standing Rock in the second term of his administration, it re-energized everything that the administration um, was focused on with Indian country. The president was always philosophically supportive of moving the needle forward with tribes. He became personally invested after his visit to Sandy Rock. So one of the things that came out of this communication that was so vital was uh, an executive order that President Obama issued in, in 2013 is a direct result of tribal requests. It was the creation of the White House Council on Native American Affairs. It wasn't an outward looking council, it was an inward looking council. It was looking at how does federal agencies touch upon Indian country in so many different ways. And I'll give you an example. So I was at the Department of Interior. Interior had a touch with tribes on literally every issue that you can think of but for healthcare that was over at HHS. So housing, HUD had issues. And, and responsibilities with regard to tribes uh, and housing. Interior also dealt with housing issues. So what this looked at really, tribes basically said to the administration, we have to deal with so many different federal agencies and you're not even talking to each other about your common programs. Can you all 
get together and talk about how you can better serve Indian country in a coordinated fashion. And so this was uh, chaired by Secretary Jewell. There were over 30 departments. Uh, they met three times a year. Again, it is um, embodied in an executive order that is still on the books. They had five subgroups, education, health, energy, environment and climate and economic development and infrastructure. Um, this is a, is a memorandum of understanding between uh, a number of federal agencies for the protection of tribal treaty rights. This would not have happened, this is still on the books, by the way, for those of you that are um, tribal leaders or, or work with tribes regularly. This is still on the books and this is basically a commitment by Justice, um, uh, Department of Defense, EPA, Interior, you can see the agencies there for yourself, about the implementation of treaty rights and the respect for treaty rights. And so um, it's a commitment to protect those treaty rights and other rights to natural resources through enhanced protection. Um, important recognitions there about tribes ceding millions of acres of land to the United States and reserving rights to themselves as well as part of that session. Um, so what does it do? It share, it, it's a commitment to um, integrate consideration of treaty rights. It's to share resources and tools to identify and understand what those treaty rights mean. And that when you're within a federal agency, how EPA may interpret a treaty right may be different than how the Justice Department or the Interior Department. And so this provides that collaboration among federal agencies to make sure that they're moving forward um, in a coordinated fashion. It was signed by the uh, highest levels of each department. And like I said, it's still on the books. I don't know that it, if, whether it's being implemented and has any, any life in it today as we speak, but it's still there. And if the next administration wants to breathe life into it and tribes want to utilize it, um, I think it holds great promise. So what does the future hold? Um, uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, it starts with leadership. Right, it's the collaboration between federal, tribal, state level dialogue to, to promote this collaboration. It's about working together uh, to maximize resources. I think at the federal, state and tribal levels, resources are stressed, probably more stressed than any time in recent memory. Tribes can bring a lot to the table. Tribes since uh, the advent of Indian gaming have uh, invested resources in biologists, um, in scientists. Um, they have the technical capacity um, in, in many respects, in my view, that far exceeds the Department of Interior, for example, to tackle very difficult issues. Um, everyone has a strong incentive for a cleaner environment. Um, tribes, I, I would argue more so than others because the reduced area of their homelands right now, their reservations are all that they have left and that's their permanent homeland. That's gonna, that's gonna last for generations and gener generations. Um, and then, uh, as Cynthia mentioned, tribes are at the forefront of climate change. Those impacts are being real, and so tribes, states, um, and the federal government need to work together to, to tackle those. And, you know, I will um, close with this. Uh, at the Department of Interior, uh, I had the opportunity to work with a number of different states. And when I joined the department, um, Alaska had leadership for whatever reason had decided to take a very adversarial role with regard to tribes and we're suing tribes within its state. They changed leadership and Governor Walker came in and, and Lieutenant Governor Byron Malat came in and they said, we're not going to be adversaries with tribes anymore. We're going to work through difficult issues and we're gonna work on those issues. And you saw a sea change you know, they didn't, tribes and, and the state of Alaska didn't agree on everything, but they weren't in litigation wasting each other's resources. They were trying to work together to see where there was common ground. And I saw the exact opposite in the state, state of Maine, where uh, Governor LePage at the time would not even sit down in a dialogue with tribes. So the tribes invited the Department of Interior, the congressional delegation, and the state delegation to sit down and talk about very difficult issues in the state of Maine and the, and the challenges that tribes were having. Every congressional delegation, regardless of party, attended. Um, the department attended. All of the tribes attended. 
the governor's office was absent from that conversation. Um, and so, again, it comes down to, to leadership and relationships. Um, the, you know, what the future holds with the EPA, I think tribes are more engaged now than ever to be partners with states and the federal government and, you know, for advance those common interests. So thank you. Thanks, Larry. Um, Martha? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to move through this really quickly. I don't have slides. You're just gonna have to look at me. Um, uh, so we can get to questions, because I'm, I'm sure that uh, you're gonna have a lot of questions, at least I hope so. So uh, I'm, I'm here, again, thank you very much. This is my second time up here, and I'm uh, here to talk about the relationship between EPA and the states, sort of talking about what it is now, and then where it can, be, where it can go in the future. Uh, and I sort of touched on some concepts yesterday uh, when, I, when I spoke, and I'm going to continue on with those. And for, fortunately, I have a roadmap that is already in place. Um, and I think many of you have seen this. This is called Cooperative Federalism 2.0. Um, this, this is an ECOS document, and, and uh, you know what ECOS is, uh, Environmental Council of States. Uh, in the in the, and I apologize, I talk very fast, but that'll get me get us through this quickly. Um, the uh, ECOS in the end of 2015, early part of 2016, saw the opportunity of a new president, he or she, and their administration, and as an opportunity to rethink the relationships that the states have had with EPA to see where can this go in the future. So the states have already worked on this. Um, and this is the, re the result of, of that work is this Cooperative Federalism 2.0 that was actually finalized in June of, of 2017. It is on the ECOS website. You don't have to try to read it from where you are. Uh, good luck with that. But if you want to see it, go to the, to the ECOS website. So uh, uh, why did, how did we do this and why did we do this? So again, it's to see how we can reset the bar, the relationship with, with EPA. A couple things I want to point out about the development of this document. So the membership of ECOS at, at this time was about 47 of the 50 states. So nearly all of them. Uh, this was a, a, a document that had the unanimous support of every state that was a member at the time, and there still are members of ECOS. So if you think about it, think about the politics, uh, the difference between the states, where you're talking about California and Texas, or North Dakota and Massachusetts. We all agreed, and so what did we talk about? So we all recognize that the states, as well as EPA, as I mentioned yesterday, become much more sophisticated in the implementation of uh, the environmental programs, much different from when the environmental programs first started and EPA was brand new and it was, a, it was EPA telling, really frankly from the state's perspective, okay, telling states what they had to do, great oversight, detailed oversight, are you doing everything correctly? That has evolved and has, and, and I think is continuing to evolve, uh, recognizing that, th again, with the maturity of the state programs, the fact that the states are doing most of the implementation, regulator, you know, regulations, water quality standards, control strategies for air quality requirements, doing monitoring of environmental factors, uh, uh, issuing the permits and the licenses, uh, going out and doing inspections, doing compliance assurance, and, and doing enforcement. Largely, states are doing that, right? And the states want to have the flexibility to do that in a way that recognizes their unique individual characteristics. So we're not just talking, you know, the the the, the watersheds in in the northeast or the or the or the northwest and the deserts of Colorado, for example. That's a big issue, and the and the priority environmental priorities of the states are very different from that perspective. But also, frankly, to recognize the difference in politics uh, and how the states had to manage their programs within their borders in order to achieve, everyone wanted to achieve, solid environmental compliance, public health protections. Remember I said that yesterday, largely the environmental programs are public health protection programs. I still really much, I very much believe that. 
All the states were very interested in doing that, but many of them wanted to do it in their own way. And they wanted to have the flexibility to be able to decide how to do it. Less oversight of EPA, uh, EPA doing, as we've talked about, sort of program audits as opposed to looking at each individual decision that the states were making. making. Just make sure that the states are meeting the objectives of these environmental programs. Are they moving the needle? Are they improving the environment? That's really what counts. Hard measurement, very hard measurement. All the states are having to do that now. This is part of the lean management that not only is EPA doing under Henry Darwin, but all the states are having to do that as well. And trying to measure environmental improvements, as you all know, is really tough. It's hard to tell a story when you're going from a 52% compliance of uh, water quality standards in, a, in, in throughout the state, and your goal in two years is to go to 54. It's your governor doesn't like that. I know from personal experience. So, um, so what? So what are we? What are we talking about here? Uh, uh, states want to be partners with EPA. We want to share in the program development, not just hearing what EPA comes out with, but actually working with EPA on what that, what that program should look like, um, what the regulations should look like. And that's very tough from an Administrative uh, Procedures Act, the Federal Administrative Procedures Act, but really partnering with, with EPA on what it means to have a regulation for this particular state or that particular, what does it mean? How is it going to be implemented? How can we do this realistically? Is it really going to make a difference? So talking about that. Uh, uh, recognizing that uh, EPA, I mentioned this yesterday as well, they're the research arm. States don't have the ability to, they don't have the labs. Some states do, California may. But most states don't have the, the, the ability to look at research. Uh, so it's critical that we have the EPA ORD and the, uh, uh, and the science behind the decisions that are made and that we understand what those decisions are and that we help provide input into those decisions, but that it is still is EPA that has to do the research and to provide much of the data that, 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 com that we use. Uh, it, it's also EPA really is the, has to resolve the disputes between the states. Um, that, you know, there's always gonna be disputes, there's always gonna be issues one state to another Water, water knows no boundaries. It's the watershed. It's not doesn't stop at the state. Uh, same with air sheds. It, it, you got to have an EPA there to help resolve those differences or the the issues that that arise between the states. So um, I know I'm kind of jumping around here. So generally, how can how can the partnership with states be strengthened to meet future challenges? Again, working with the states, working with the tribes. Uh, it's a partnership. And when EPA is looking at what should that look like in the future, you need to talk to the states and the tribes in order to, to develop what that future looks like. If it's a partnership, partnerships don't evolve with just one side of it deciding things. You got to have everyone that's part of that partnership at the table to talk about, which is what we're doing here, but maybe more states, maybe more tribes, to talk about what the future is. Uh, partnerships need to be developed, we talked about that as well, with local governments, with NGOs. We got to not duplicate work. That, you, nobody has the capacity for that anymore. You got to figure out what's the most efficient way of, of protecting the environment, protecting public health. Uh, and, and that really means you got to trust each other. There's a relationship building here that has to happen. Frankly, I think that, that there is a great, I can say this from the Colorado perspective, it may not be this case with all states, because you all work with states, but I think there's, from my perspective, there's great trust with EPA. Uh, even I would say the EPA, it's there today, depending on who you're talking to. Okay, I'm gonna back off of that a little bit. Um, just a little bit. Uh, ben Grumbles yesterday talked about e-enterprise, and so I won't go there, but that's, a, that's a, another area where states and tribes are working with EPA to uh, advance environmental 
technology and processes and really figure out how to make things work. ITRC is another area where we're working with industry uh, to, to look at sort of technical advances that can be used in different environmental areas. Um, I gotta look at my notes here real quick. I talked yesterday about acknowledgement of experience and skills. Where are the skills? Who, who can do what better? Recognizing that and allowing that to go forward. Um, a, a couple, and that, and that will give us, if we can be more efficient, that will give us the capacity, the room to do sort of the innovative things that we all want to do. This is the block and blocking and tackling, which I would, first when I heard that, I was thinking fishing. And then I realized, no, Martha, you just never played football. But at any rate, the, uh, <laughs> you know, tackle, uh, never mind. Um, but I, but I, uh, I think we all want to do more with the, with the environment. There's, it is... There's so, there really is so much left. We don't think of that, and maybe the public doesn't think that there's the much left to deal with the environment, but the complexity is much, much greater now than it ever has been. When states are having to deal with emerging contaminants like PFAS and PFOA, when you're, when you're dealing with different toxics that are in the environment, when you're dealing with uh, the air quality issues, the climate change, these are really heady, hard, difficult issues. A lot, of the re, what it makes, what, a lot of what makes them difficult is trying to get communities behind whatever it is you're talking about and understanding that what you're doing is really trying to help them and not cost them. And so uh, it becomes even more imperative that we work together and we figure out how to move forward together to, to help with these programs. And we cannot, again, duplicate efforts. We cannot be sort of this, you know, the parent-child relationship. It, that has to evolve beyond, beyond what it has been. One uh, observation that I have, personal observation, is having conversations that are not rooted around a particular regulatory process that's occurring, an enforcement action that's occurring, just getting together and talking. Here is a potential issue that may come up. We should talk about it. What would, you know, imagine a great solution to this issue. What's an issue that's really bugging you? Let's talk about it. Not with the expectation that there's going to be an enforcement action not with the expectation that there's going to be some sort of regulatory action, but just to sit down and to continue to have those conversations and to develop the relationships so that when an issue comes up, that relationship is there and that trust factor is there. Because there is a trust issue. There just is a trust issue. Some states, as you well know, don't trust EPA. And we talked about this. Depending on the state, depending on the administration, you know, it can flip. As long as you can have that conversation and really talk to each other outside the context of a particular, what could be perceived as a gotcha, then you're getting a relationship going so that when an issue comes up, you have a better trust relationship and you can resolve it. So that's sort of my gratuitous ending. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, uh, excellent presentations. I think uh, you, got, you all got um, some of the best thinking consolidated already on, on the evolving federalism, which continues to evolve even under the Constitution. And also, uh, as Larry said, 200 years of, of, uh, plus of, of tribal law and history, uh, which is the context for how we figure out how we go forward. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to ask the panel any questions. We're, I'm going to move to the audience. But I want to ask one audience member first, um, uh, Frank, Frank Edagisic, who is the, um, is the uh, executive director of the United Tribes of Michigan. Um, one of the things that I noticed when I was at EPA was that there were in some parts of the country where there are enough 
there's enough tribal presence in a geography that sometimes there's some coordination between the tribes. And, and we, didn't, uh, we didn't get, because of the time limits, we didn't get to the point of, of coordination between tribes. And, and Frank, so I hope you have a few other comments, but uh, could you start us off with either comments or, or questions for the panel, and then we'll move to the rest. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I served for 14 years as the tribal chairman for the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians in Michigan. So I tell people I'm a recovering politician. And then I uh, have now spent 10 years in a staff position as executive director of the United Tribes of Michigan. And in that time period, I've had occasion to work on a lot of different issues. But things that, and particularly in light of you know, where, where does, is EPA going from here, looking forward based on what we've done in the past, in relationships and the what two <clears throat> a couple of points that I thought were really important and that is that that there's along with the all of the there's a trust responsibility that's been set up based on all the information that you that you have and so the federal government uh, is the trustee for the tribes in those treaty reserved rights and issues that we have. So very often, for instance, there's the United States versus Michigan was a case on uh, the exercise of hunting and fishing and gathering rights in, in the state. And, but within that trust responsibility, there's a number of different things in, which spill over, for instance, to EPA in that there's a trust responsibility of the government as a whole and also of its different parts. So. EPA has a federal responsibility, and there's a law passed, say, for wetland permits, and EPA is not doing that any longer. What they do is they've passed that responsibility onto the states. And this is true for not just this, but a number of different departments, number of different issues. But somewhere along the line, when that gets passed to the states, the trust responsibility to be protecting our rights and or consulting with the tribes, that disappears. And the state then says, we don't have a trust responsibility, so we don't have to consult and do anything. So we've been arguing that this doesn't actually go away, that re EPA still has that responsibility. So as we look to the future, it's important for us to figure out that in any delegation of responsibility, that there has to be, this issue has to be addressed so that we don't run into the issues where things are happening around us that we have, that as tribes, that we have no, no control over. And I wanted to raise that point because it's a, it's a really sticking point for many of the tribes in, in our area. And the other one is, is that uh, I've heard a couple of cases here where people were talking about um, the exercise of treaty rights in terms of, you know, the people uh, hunting and fishing, for instance. And, but there's another aspect of this, and that is that, that those treaty responsibilities, those treaty reserved rights are also a tool that can be used to help protect the environment. And an example of this was a cement plant that was uh, an old cement plant that had been decommissioned in Michigan. And this area was being developed. It's called Bay Harbor. And uh, the state wanted this brownfield site done, so they signed a hold harmless agreement with the developer. And then subsequent to that, after the houses, million dollar houses were built and everything, they found that the pH on the beach from the leachate coming through the old kiln dust piles was 13 on the beach. 100 feet from shore, it was still nine. And this was just unacceptable. And that what happened is, is that we had fishermen in the water right offshore. So the, the state of Michigan went to the developer and said, please clean up. But because they had a hold harmless agreement, they could just say, please. They couldn't say, you have to. But the tribe, on the other hand, because of the trust relationship, we called in EPA. And then we convened a meeting in a room like this of all the, the PRPs, who everybody was pointing every which way, as you might imagine, uh, because this was going to be a huge job. And because we were able to bring in EPA, 
with that trust relationship. Uh, we actually made sure that there was an enforceable plan for cleaning this up. And the state now is, is sort of monitoring that as it's at, toward the end. But this is just some examples of how the tribes and the EPA have worked together. And we need to think about what kind of things we can do as we go to the future, uh, in particularly as we look at what the role may be in these international agreements that, are, that EPA has played a role in, in helping to work in, inter, in the international arena. And tribes are very much involved in that international arena. So with that, I just, right. uh, I, I just wanted to make those points, and then I'm willing to take any questions or be with questions here for okay. these folks. But well, I did want to compliment the panel, because uh, there's been a very comprehensive and very good yeah. uh, presentation. So, OK. Thank you. I, I mean, I think it's this issue of consultation, which gets to the issue of trust, which I think we've heard everybody talk about, you know, how do we trust, you know, there's always been trust and verify. So, I mean, it's a, we're evolving on all of these fronts. And, you know, um, you know, consultation is an important part when you were trying to build partners. It's hard to have partnerships without consultation. Questions? Um, um, all right, everybody's hand went on simultaneously. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on you, Scott. And did, Bill, did you have your hand up? And then um, Mr. Riley. Your, uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, a project that we undertook in cooperation with ECOS was the, the, the Macbeth Report, named in honor of our, um, our departed colleague, Angus Macbeth. Um, it really was an effort to try to tease out some of the devils in, in the details in Cooperative Federalism 2.0. Oh, commend it to your reading. Um, uh, you can find it on the ELI website. Uh, the one observation I'd make uh, on that is that uh, it suggested that this idea of programmatic auditing might be focused initially on permit oversight, um, uh, the theory being that in that context, there are accountability systems or assurance systems um, that help uh, mitigate uh, against any risk of, uh, of incorrect decisions being made, including the ability to challenge permits in the state permit system, and also the, the fact that these permits are all, all subject to renewal at some point. So the costs of a miscue are not uh, perhaps so great in that context. Uh, but I mainly just wanted to make sure folks knew that report was out there. There's some really interesting survey information in it. Up here. Make sure you identify yourself. Um, hi, I'm Kelly Crawford um, from the District Department of Energy and Environment. Um, for Martha, um, given the recent reorgs at Region 3, I don't know if it's happening. I know it's happening in all states. I don't know if it impacted your region specifically. But can you just talk about how that's changing the way that the states are going to interface with the regions going forward? If I knew exactly how things are being reorganized, I might be able to answer that question. Um, I, don't, I don't know that I anticipate, at least in Colorado, and I doubt if the states are going to really see much difference because the people are going to be the same. The, the organization within the region may be different, but the regional offices are there. Um, the, you know, like in Region 8, I mean, we did lose our... Region 8 administrator, and we have a, an acting now, but the, but the career people are still there. So the programs are still going to be talking to the career people that they've been talking to, frankly. And uh, I, you're not shaking your head. I don't know what that means. But, the, but the, <laughs> maybe, I'm, maybe I'm wrong. But I, but I, you know, I, I, think that the, I think that the relationship, <laughs> I don't know that it will change. I think that the intent, at least at the state level, is to still is to still deal with EPA as we have before. So well, I can, I mean, one of the things that, and there, others may have a point on this, and I'm going to try to say this very quickly. One of the things that's a constant tension between the headquarters and the regions and the states is: are the regions organized to be integrators, or are they organized along the particular statutory requirements? And there was a move going back to the '90s to have some aspects of the regions be more integrator organizations. And I think the current reorganization is going back toward more statutory organizations. I may not be 100% correct, but 
but I, I believe, and I'm getting some nods out there, and I believe Martha's point eventually will be true in that the people who, if you had to work with somebody on air problems, the chances are extremely high that wherever they got put, they're still going to be the one working on air problems. But it's not a guarantee, as long as they don't change the phone numbers. Um, yes, over here. Integrate the uh, our, our goal, which is, uh, um, you know, uh, yeah. I'll try it again. I'm sorry. In, in never never-ending effort to to integrate our our effort to meet our re regulatory responsibilities to protect the resource, and and and, uh, and, and when the resource itself uh, cross the lines of states, uh, uh, cross the lines of uh, tribes. Uh, tribes and states uh, crossing lines, and it was some issue that I don't think we ever were able to to resolve. Uh, question is, question is who who's in charge of protecting that resource? What is EPA's role versus the state versus the tribe? Uh, is, is not not a settled issue, and I think uh, in your future presentations, uh, I, I think uh, deal with some of the some of the uh, cross cross. Uh, coordination issues that you got to deal with. I, I'm going to deal with two. The shared resources, obviously. The rivers flow, flow across lines without, uh, without political boundary. Um, the other is the tribe itself is co-located with a city, a lot of times, except for the big tribes that have, uh, have the, uh, co-located with the city, the state, and the federal government, and, and, and how, to, how to deal with environmental protection and public health protection with that is, is very difficult. And finally, Finally, uh, we spent my whole, whole career. We spent trying to get the state's delegation in shape, and uh, Bob talked about that a good bit. I think we've gone a long way toward that. Part of the uh, delegation effort was to make sure that the federal go federal program was uh, uh, was implemented as the feds would do it if they were in charge. Uh, you know, it, it be be no less stringent than the fed. And making sure that would happen is tough. And in terms of the tribes, I, I think uh, we don't delegate, at least in the uh, Clean Water Act, some, but Safe Drinking Water Act, not at all. Uh, delegate to to the tribes to be de designated as a state. We need, we need okay. a question. Yeah, You're gonna have a the, question. The, 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 the question really is how how do we deal with how do we deal with uh, making progress with the. Uh, coordination issues that are required when you're protecting the very resource. quick anything. We're out, we're out of time, which I hate to say, but, uh, you know. Right, we're, um, so uh, I'll uh, get to you, Bill. To, uh, with co the coordination issues. I think um, in Colorado, we have two tribes. And we uh, the, the tribe that we deal with the most is the Southern Ute tribe. Big tribe, 600,000 acres. About half of the uh, reservation is tribal land. The rest is not. Um, we have worked with the tribe on a number of things. There's an air quality program I won't go into, but it's unique to Colorado and, and the Southern Ute Tribe, where we have joint jurisdiction over air quality issues on inside the exterior boundaries of the reservation. Water quality is always an issue. Um, I don't think we handle that well, and, and part of that is um, an issue that the states have is that data. It, it may be shared with EPA, but it is not shared with the state. And I think that's an issue, okay. water quality data. Bill, you, you had your hand up. Thank you. I recall visiting Pueblos in New Mexico and uh, was required under the law to ascertain whether they had capability, administrative, and the rest. And they had Paul Weiss lawyers and fancy accountants. The tribe was totally in command. And so made the decision to give them full state water quality authority. There was anything but trust as a response to that, however. The Albuquerque newspaper 
Uh, I've met with their editorial board. They said, you've conferred authority to bankrupt the city of Albuquerque, cost us billions of dollars. I remember saying, look, they've got two senators and a congressman, or you've got two senators and a congressman in the newspaper. All they've got is me and the Water Quality Act. But go look at the putrid water you're delivering to them. Um, the only uh, comments made by senators, the private comments, were scathing about that decision. I went back to Washington. The only person who really stood up publicly and defended it was John McCain. But my question is, has so much changed now? And did they do the kinds of constructive things that they had authority to do? It was, I assume that lawsuit was Albuquerque v. EPA. I assume that was that decision. Larry, do you have some? I, I guess uh, very briefly, I would. I, my viewpoint is that things have changed, and it's become less adversarial because of those wins by EPA with regard to Albuquerque versus Browner, Montana versus EPA, Wisconsin versus EPA. I don't think you see as much litigation. There's Arizona Public Services versus EPA. EPA, by and large, prevailed in much of that litigation. And did the tribes get the water cleaned up yeah, from Albuquerque? Yeah, so Right, yes, Great. and so, and also, I mean, a, a, a big proponent for the Wisconsin versus EPA case was there was a tribe in northern Wisconsin that was downstream from a proposed mine that they were very concerned that was going to impact their traditional wild rice beds. Great. And they put those standards in place. Thank you. So I, Bill, I became the assistant administrator for water right after your time as you administrator. So I, I visit with the Asleta Pueblo several times, as well as the city of Albuquerque in the state of New Mexico. And, and there was, there, you know, obviously litigation sometimes, whichever way it goes, then forces future consultation. And so, you know, I think that that has, I'm not going to say the water is as clean as it needs to be, but there, there's a functional, you know, process under underway there. And the answer to, to the question, I think, and then I'm, we're going to have to stop, is that you know, the, if, if there's an issue of fishing or an issue of the use of the resource, out, such as the water in, in the, that's the Rio Grande, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Um, the river um, uh, for use for drinking water at a tribe downstream from a major city, or if it's uh, having the availability of salmon in the Northwest, you know, the peop, if, if the, reason, the federal government is responsible for those resources to be there under their trust responsibility, and that's not just EPA. I mean, it could be the, it could be the, the power authority in the Northwest that runs the dams, or it could be the Department of Interior and how they manage lands. But the federal government has the, the responsibility for those, the continuation of the use of those resources. And a, a, an, old, an old friend of mine who's passed away, Billy Frank, you know, went to jail many, many times, you know, uh, you know just trying to fish for salmon in the Northwest and, and being told he couldn't do it. When, when eventually uh, the laws were changed, I mean, the laws were recognized that the federal government had those responsibilities. So federal government, not just EPA, is responsible for the delivery of those resources. That's my, that's my view, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> thank you, everyone, and thank the panel. So uh, quick thank you to the panel for a wonderful conversation. I also want to thank Dan Fiorino, who is the uh, spark that got this entire conference uh, started. He is heading off to teach his last class of the semester. But thank you very much to Dan. Uh, we are, our last substantive uh, panel of the day will start in about 10 minutes. Um, and we're ending on a high note with a, a positive story of EPA collaboration uh, to work on issues in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, but I also recognize that there's been some sort of pent up desire to talk further about each of the wonderful issues that have come up in the panels. Um, and so I just want to emphasize that the discussion that John Reeder will lead at 315 is very much meant to be an open conversation about the ideas that we've talked about over the last two days, and in particular, how to sort of synthesize the insights into some sort of document that could then be taken on the road for a broader conversation nationwide. So please join us for that conversation at 315, particularly if you have a burning question that you feel hasn't yet been answered. Thanks. <laughs>